Throughout history, the continent of Africa and its inhabitants have been subject to a host of negative stereotypes and misconceptions. No matter where they live, Africans or other Afro-descended people appear to have faced some type of prejudice, discrimination, or subjugation. From the transatlantic slave trade, to colonial rule, Africa and its people have been viewed as a threat to Western civilization. But why? Since this began, a sizable amount of time has passed, and experts who have sought to explain why this is the case have presented a number of fascinating suggestions. Join us in our video today as we delve into the historical context and power dynamics that have contributed to this harmful narrative, and explore the impact it has had on the continent and its people. But first, to ensure that you don't miss out on more great content like this. Please take a moment to like and subscribe to Africa Info Hub. Also, click on the notification bell. Without much delay, let's dive into the video. The work of Greek scholars and historians like Theodora Siculus and Herodotus, illuminates a significant tale that did exist in ancient times, even if there are questions regarding their accuracy. Whether their claims about Africa were true, they nonetheless provide insight into later eras by showing what the elite's everyday speech about the continent was like. Numerous ancient stories imply, or at the very least consider, the notion that Africans were the first people and among the first to become civilized. And this might well be true, because according to history, the first males were Ethiopians. Furthermore, historians claim that Ethiopians were the first people to bear children, and they cite obvious evidence to support their claim. Because of this, they legitimately bear the appellation autochthons because they were local to their region and did not immigrate there as foreigners did. The commonly held belief that people who live where the noonday sun shines were probably among the first creatures the earth produced is another intriguing argument that supports this idea. Given that the sun's warmth dried out the earth when it was still wet and endowed it with life at the beginning of the cosmos, it makes sense to infer that the region nearest to the sun was the first to birth living beings. Remarkably, a Greek scholar came to the same conclusion on where humans first developed, and agreed that this birthplace was on the African continent. More recently, there have been references to this tale. One of the most well-known Orientalists of the 18th century was a man by the name of Constantine de Volney, whose work is now frequently referred to as Middle Eastern Studies. According to Constantine de Volney, there are good grounds for thinking that the first educated nation was a black nation and that it originated in the region bordering the tropic, Sudan, and southern Egypt. He goes on to claim that it is incontrovertible that by the term Ethiopians, the ancients meant to represent a people of black complexion, thick lips and woolly hair. Despite what our perspective is today, people in ancient times and even some of the earliest observers concluded that humanity's oldest civilizations and people were Africans. It's important to note that this stance has recently come under scrutiny. However, if we use this historical perspective and the perspective provided by de Volney, we can definitely see the first stages of how African people started to be seen as a threat since the ramifications of having the oldest human population and possessing the oldest civilizations are obvious. For our second justification, it is a concept that expands on the first historical model to explain why African people would have been viewed as dangerous. The myth propagated by ancient scribes and their modern colleagues, eventually gave rise to a primitive fear of genetic ruin. Therefore, if these Africans are the oldest people on earth, it stands to reason that, in that scenario, mankind can simply revert to its original African form. The one-drop rule, which effectively stated that anyone with one drop of African blood had tainted the non-African blood, and should be classified as black or negro, was a school of thought that, despite its peculiar sound, was prevalent at the time. It is clear that the purpose of this idea was to set African ancestry apart from other ancestries, regardless of color or look. Since they would be treated unfairly, and held in the same low position as other black people as a result of their identification, they would be unable to compete in the political, social, economic, and particularly genetic sectors. However, not every European ethnic group in Latin America believed in genetic extinction. For instance, the Spanish and Portuguese claimed that a new class and ethnicity were established by the enslaved African women they used as mothers. The majority of these folks were privileged and had access to all the goods and services that society has to offer. 
It appears that Arabs are also affected by this. Because in some ways, the Arab slave trade was just as cruel and dehumanizing as the Atlantic slave trade, and they undoubtedly had children with slave African women. A few of these kids were able to live their lives as Arabs because they truly accepted the identity and culture of their Arab fathers. Some Moors acknowledged their dual lineage as being both Arab and African, while once again fully identifying with a non-African father. Many Arabs, presumably to remove that genetic risk, also preserved the eunuch's culture among the Africans they held as slaves. Finally, non-African cultures with imperial authority were the only ones who believed Africans posed a genetic threat to everyone else. One of the most well-known threats appears to be the African continent's abundance of resources that can be converted into wealth. It is no secret that many modern-day countries sought to control the enormous resources found in Africa, and were mostly successful in doing so. This was undeniably true in both the ancient and medieval eras, and the Arabs were well aware of this when they first encountered the empires of Ghana and Mali. Muslim authors have often discussed what they had learned from the travelers who came to Ghana and its neighboring cultures. It is not overstated to claim that the Arabs were awestruck by the Ghana Empire's wealth. As a matter of fact, Ibrahim al-Fazari, an astronomer, was the first author to mention the Ghana Empire, where he referred to it literally as the country of gold sometime after the year 800 AD. The 10th century Arab Muslim writer, geographer, and chronicler, Ali ibn Orkal, who also traveled during the years 943 to 969 AD, a century later, referred to the monarch of Ghana as the richest sovereign on earth because of his enormous wealth and gold reserves. Unfortunately, this nation has been mined for its benefit since ancient times. Also, according to Cheek Antidiope, who was a Senegalese historian, anthropologist, physicist, and politician who studied the human race's origins and pre-colonial African culture, Africa was so distinguished in the world for its legendary wealth that it led the Arabs to say, against the camel's mange, use tar, and against poverty, make a trip to Sudan. This demonstrates just how highly esteemed the continent of Africa was. And even more, was that everyone knew about its enormous fortune and wanted a piece of it. Apparently, the Arabs supported it and turned it into a proverb. Mansa Musa's voyage to Cairo, where he demonstrated his vast wealth and authority, surely astounded the world, but it also brought to light the vast wealth of a prosperous continent. Because everyone was aware that having access to resources and riches always consolidates and reinforces authority, this just helped to provide more reasons to be threatened by the wealthy African continent. It is evident that Africans were regarded as the proprietors, initially from an Arab standpoint and afterwards from a European perspective. But to whom much is given, much is expected and for Africans, all the power only emphasized their labels as threats to the world, and this history provides an intriguing picture of the reasons. From the early narrative of Africans being the first humans, the limited yet ever-present idea of genetic annihilation, and finally, the perceived advantage of immediate access to immense wealth and resources, naturally made Africans a threat to their neighbors, and could perhaps be reason for the strong opposition to pan-African groups and other economic behemoths like Black Wall Street. It's worth mentioning that this narrative also has been used to justify the exploitation of Africa's resources and the continuation of systemic poverty in the continent. It is important to understand that the way Africa and its people have been portrayed is not just a matter of perception but also a matter of power. To this day, Africa is still facing the consequences of being viewed as a threat and it is important to work towards dismantling these harmful narratives. Nonetheless, it's time to acknowledge and reject these unfavorable stereotypes and work toward a more truthful and just understanding of Africa and its peoples. If people with African ancestry can come together globally under one identity, they can reclaim their ownership. That concludes our video on why African Americans were historically viewed as a threat. What do you think of our video? Let us know in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, tell your friends about it and hit the like button. Also, share with friends on Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter.